Cheers. All right. Cheers. I know. Cheers. We're live with Jane Velez Mitchell. How are you, Jane? I'm fine. And I want to set the record straight. This is not a mimosa. I'm 20 I know. years sober in three yeah. months. So this is a sparkling water with orange juice. In three months. What was, what was the impetus My three months, 25 years ago? Oh, huh. Well, my sobriety date is April Fool's Day. Very oh. appropriate. I made a big fool of myself at a party in West Hollywood. And my boyfriend at the time carried me out of her shoulder. And the next morning, I thought he had left because I didn't see him sleeping downstairs on the couch. And so I called a friend and I got help. But then when I walked back into the living room, there he was sleeping on the couch. If I had seen that, I wouldn't have gotten the help I needed. So I had the gift of desperation at that moment. But, you know, when you hit bottom on anything, whether it's alcohol, drugs, meat, um, you have a moment of clarity. And if you don't, at that moment of clarity where you can see it realistically, where you're not right. hijacked by the addiction, if you don't act during that time frame, that window of opportunity closes and then you go back to the old pattern. So I was very lucky that uh, I... I got my friend who had gotten sober recently. We used to be party buddies together and he had yeah. just gotten sober and he was bugging me to get sober. And then I made a fool of myself at this party and I called him and, you know, the obsession was knock on wood one day at a time. A little yep. It was lifted. And here I am. Uh, I couldn't go one day without a drink at night. I was one of those. I drink after work. I play hard, work hard. I play hard. I told myself all this. Right. Stuff. But one day at a time for 25 years and three months, I haven't had a drink and I don't miss it even. Really? Like, really? wow. I mean, I mean, cold turkey. You, did you go through a tofurky. program or? Cold tofurkey. Tofurkey. Okay. I know you're you're a big, big yeah. vegan and all that stuff. We have so much to talk about with you. Um, you know, first of all, how are you doing during the pandemic? How has life altered for you personally? I uh, am doing great. Uh, I'm a little terrified that I like it. I am terrified that there's something about this entire thing that my life was just such a scramble and I kept adding more, 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 more. And uh, now my life has gotten simpler and I'm yeah. still productive. I work from, you know, 7 a.m. to probably eight at night every day. Yeah. But I feel like uh, there's a simpler thing going on. Um uh, I thought since I was an only child and I always okay. felt like I had FOMO and uh, I did suffer from FOMO. Like if there's a party, I want to be there because I don't want to miss that party. But now I realize that I'm not lonely. And um, by the way, just because I said I had a boyfriend after that, I, I always joke because he was the one also bugging me to get <laughs> sober. Right. And after I got sober and I couldn't drink down my sexual orientation, I came out as gay. So poor guy, he created, he created a bit of a problem, but we're still friends. We're still right. Friends. That's good. He That's was a good. friend too. Yeah. 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 Well, so Ian Murphy, I, I know Ian is, he's into uh, like computer science. He's a brilliant guy. He says, how do you cope? I went through something like that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Cope with being sober. Uh, I don't know. Quarantine. I don't know. Well, know we're, we're all kind of dealing with the alcohol. new normal. It's probably yeah. alcohol because I went through something like that. We're still going. He'd say, I'm yeah. going through a true. You know, look, um, shoulda, coulda, woulda. I wish I had gotten sober many years earlier, but what they say in sobriety and various, you know, uh, approaches do not right. remember the past. Your experience can benefit somebody else. So I'm, I'm lucky. I never even got a DUI. I never lost the house, the job, the car, although there were many right. days I walk, went to work hung over. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm just so happy. I don't have to live like that. I don't have to live with a hangover. Uh, I, my, as they say, this is a cliche, but it's worth repeating. My worst day sober is better than my best day drunk. Yeah. I, I do feel um, I was a very cynical, you know, hard bitten news reporter. And I thought I was tough and I didn't do anything like believe in a higher power or pray or believe in anything. And then I had a miracle. I personally experienced a miracle because for years 
And my dad was a high functioning alcoholic too. And uh, so for years I said, I'm not gonna drink tonight and I couldn't, I could not. I was like, I became hijacked by this craving. And then after I sought help, uh, I realized I had a psychic shift and that's what they call it. Sometimes mm. it happens right away. Sometimes it happens slowly, but um, I realized I don't have to drink today. And this yeah. is what I tell people about other things like uh, eating animals, you know, it, it's willpower doesn't work, but when you have a moment of clarity and you say, I consider myself a decent moral person, I wouldn't cut off my dog's tail without anesthesia. I wouldn't chop off yeah. without anesthesia or, uh, do any of the other or hang him up by one leg and slit his throat and bleed him to death. Yeah. So why am I participating in that when it comes to another species that has the same exact emotional um, uh, capability as my dog? And then when you have that moment of clarity and you say, morally, I'm already a vegan. All I need to do is stop eating animals that also they're cancer causing, lead to heart disease. Uh, and all sorts of other health problems, not to mention guys, erectile dysfunction. Um, we could talk about yeah. that if you want. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the advertising industry tries to equate meat with masculinity, masculinity. They right. equate with a lot of things that has nothing to do with, with upward mobility, patriotism, family values, blah, blah, blah. They equate dairy with femininity and meat with masculinity. So you'll see a lot of ads with women doing yoga and then having yogurt and men are macho in their pickup trucks and, and then they're eating. But actually it's the exact opposite because plaque is what is created by cholesterol. Cholesterol right. does not exist in plants. Cholesterol only exists in animal products. And when one of the things that I don't think people really understand is that up until this pandemic, heart disease was a leading killer and it's still a leading killer. It's just the pandemic has has sort of taken the top rung for, yeah. for temporarily, hopefully temporarily. Yeah. But, so one out of every four people dies of heart disease. Heart disease is generally sure there's some genetic rare cases, but generally it's caused by your arteries to your heart getting clogged. Yeah. What do you get clogged with plaque? What does plaque come from? Cholesterol. What, where does cholesterol come from? Animals, we're animals, we produce our own cholesterol. Other animals like cows and pigs and chickens produce their cholesterol and eggs, which is the menstrual yeah. period of a chicken. Just to give you that <laughs> little extra. Mm. But never heard it um, quite that way. Yeah, so what people don't realize, so your body gets clogged, your vessels, your blood vessels get clogged and that's why they have those stent operations to clear them out yeah. and open them up. None of that would be necessary if you just got rid of the cholesterol, the additional cholesterol that your body doesn't need, which only exists in meat and dairy products and eggs. I mean, so, yeah. Yeah. And so just to wrap it up, it doesn't just happen to the heart. It happens systemically. So there are also vessels in the penis. There are also vessels in the brain. So actually mm -hmm. erectile dysfunction is a precursor of heart disease. So, the interesting part is guys who are having that problem. And if you listen to the commercials, it's like most guys, I guess, after, I don't know what, um, and after what, what an age, you mean yeah, an age, okay. they say, you know, did you know that most men, uh, over whatever, 40, I should, probably yeah, 40, whatever, they don't have to have that. They could bing, be yeah. perfectly, uh, erect, but they need to change their diet. Now, why don't doctors tell you that? Because there's no better client than an addict who needs to come back for pills over and over again. Yeah. They, if you go to a hospital, you see, well, now you just see a lot of people lying everywhere. But in, in normal times, you'll see uh, people dressed like they're going to the airport and they're carrying carry-on suitcases behind them. Those carry-on suitcases are filled with pills. And they go to the doctor's office and they pitch them like a drug pusher. Right. And the doctors get them and they distribute them. And um, the interesting thing is that our society is so mixed up that we run commercials saying, hey, <laughs> ask your doctor about this purple pill or this blue pill. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Doctors are supposed to diagnose you. You're right. not supposed to say, 
oh, wow, that sounds like something that I might have. Right. Syndrome. My leg shook the other day. I'm going to go ask for this pill. And then the side effects, I can't even eat dinner watching television because the side effects could include, you know, projectile vomiting, suicidal ideation, and all these other horrible Everything. things. It's disgusting. All of it could go away. We could lower our health care costs. We could be happier. Um, we could save tons of money. And we wouldn't be defined by our illnesses. Because right now in society, yeah. it's almost like, you know what I have? I don't know if you've ever run into people, you know, I have X, Y, Z. It really becomes part of their identity. You and kind of kind of start joking about it, like with your friends. Like the older you get, it's like, what what pill are you on? What what's going on in your body? It's a joke. I mean, among retirees, I think that you know everyone's talking about their symptoms. Exactly. I mean, who wants to live like that? It's all unnecessary. And I'm yeah. just getting started, but I'll 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 stop. <laughs> well, my I mean, husband said when he walked out, "Will you just stop talking?" Yeah. <laughs> well, was the veganism that coincided with the desire and the action to get help? Is that what happened? Well, it's very interesting you ask that question because I'd always loved animals. I had always considered myself uh, somebody who cared about animals, but it was only after I got sober just over 25 years ago that I went vegan because in a many ways, my beliefs were not in alignment with my actions. Yeah. I was disconnected. So once I got sober and I started basically coming back to planet earth and seeing things the way they were and um, started reflecting on my life, you know, uh, I, I realized my behavior, my actions are out of alignment with my values. And then what happened was I was a news anchor, a local news anchor here in LA working at KCAL TV. Yep. And that was based in the Paramount Studios a lot. And uh, that was a great job. I have to say that was my most fun job. And uh, I, would, really? I would drive into the Paramount Studios a lot, yeah, a good cool. parking spot. It was very cool. <laughs> and uh, anyway, this guy, Howard Lyman, who was a fourth generation cattle rancher who had been on Oprah, um, I don't okay. know if you remember this. She had to I move do. her case down to her show to Texas and he revealed the horrors. And she said, that just stopped me cold from eating another burger. Yes. And then the cattleman sued her and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, I, inter I interviewed him. And afterwards, he and his publicist came up to my cubicle and they said, we hear you're a vegetarian. And I said, yeah. And I was mostly, I occasionally I made up eating shellfish, but I was mostly, but I ate dairy and eggs. Right. And they said, do you eat dairy? And I kind of hung my head because he had just described how they ripped the babies away from the mothers. People oh. don't even know that cows have to be pregnant and produce offspring in order to be lactating. They don't just automatically produce milk. They've got to have babies and that nature intended the milk for those babies. So they can't stay with mommy because they'll drink the milk. So they have to pull the babies away and mother grieves and screams and the babies grieve and scream. And it's, it's a horror and they don't need the boys and they throw them either into a veal crate or they shoot them or they leave them on a dead pile. Anyway, I hung my head and I go, yes. And then the two of them turn to me and they go liquid meat right at my nose, liquid meat. And that was the moment I went vegan. Ah, uh, okay. So when yeah. they say, don't be pushy about it, don't confront people, I was like, well, I was confronted. My own hypocrisy was was exposed and I, I'm forever grateful. Yeah, I mean, you're just, I'm glad you didn't go public with that because, but then that maybe that would have led you to Dr. Phil too. And, <laughs> and you might have had a show with Dr. Phil. <laughs> well, Dr. Phil was on the same lot and I've been on Dr. Phil uh, quite a few times. Like when I came out, uh, that was, I wrote a book on it and I was on the Dr. Phil show and uh, I've been on the Dr. Phil show for quite a few, the Jody Arias trial, uh, this, that, and the other. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk to you about so much. I know that you were there for, I think, every moment of the Michael Jackson uh, trial. Did you watch the, the documentary that came mm -hmm. out about a year or so ago? What did, what did yeah. you make of that? Well, it was very believable. I mean, if those two young men are not telling the truth, they deserve an Academy Award because what they said was very, very, very believable. And the way they laid it out really made sense. It's unfortunate that one of them did testify for Michael Jackson at the trial, swearing under oath that nothing ever happened. Yeah. You know, so 
I understand he explained why he felt the need to do that, but that was unfortunate because we were all there trying to, you know, I remained very objective. It wasn't my place when I was there to be judge and jury. I was covering it. And in the uh, pool of reporters, people had very strong opinions. In fact, we couldn't even go to dinner together. Well, I couldn't go to dinner with any of them because they were meat eaters and they would right. avoid me for dinner. Um, and, uh, uh, but when I did go to dinner on the rare occasion and I sort of held my nose and I eat dinner with them, um, they couldn't sit together because there were, there was a group that felt that Michael Jackson was innocent. And there was a group that was absolutely convinced that Michael Jackson was guilty. And I, uh, followed the kind of guidance of Linda Deutsch, who was, I believe an associated press reporter who I really admired. Okay. It's a crusty, you know, like something out of a movie, uh, yeah. but, but old school. A real old school reporter. And uh, I always looked up to her. And so I thought, well, whatever Linda Deutsch does, I'm going to kind of <laughs> follow that because I respect her. I respect yeah. the journalist. And she was always very neutral. And she just was, you know, like she'd write it down, do the facts. And that was it. And I, I kind of admired that because it was difficult. It was really difficult to do. That was one of the craziest several months of my life because every day was like a reality show. You never yeah. knew what was going to happen. I was right there when Michael Jackson, the clock was ticking and uh, they were going to arrest him if he didn't show up at court and he showed up in his pajamas. Remember that one? Yeah, I remember it. And the funny part is I was standing next to Linda because I'm a very excitable person and that's, it could be good, but it also could be bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's a double-edged sword. And I, you know, sometimes when I was covering those trials, I wish I had the temperament of a Linda who would just be, she'd be like, you know, she'd just be sitting there and I'd be looking at her like, oh you're going to make it. And she'd just look at me like, I don't know. And I would work myself into a frenzy. Like you'd think I was going to be arrested and put away if, if he didn't make it there or like waiting for the verdict. Yeah. The for the verdict was like so nerve wracking. You would have thought I was on trial. Yeah. And I'll never forget it, this. There were cell phones in those days. The trial, the verdict came down, I think in 2005. And um, uh, I had, we, our reporters, we reporters had to use the porta potties outside. Ew. And uh, yeah, not, not. Uh, where not was, I forget, where was the trial? Was it in the Okay. Yeah. In the middle of, nowhere at first when yeah. it first was declared that there was going to be a case a trial for five minutes it was going to be in santa barbara and they had put me up the show i was working for in this fabulous hotel and i was like this is going to be good yeah right uh, and then uh, they changed it to santa maria which is very you know um Agri right. agri agrarian, uh, agricultural type town. And okay. I was in the best Western big America with some rabid fans on either side of me that would chase me a bit. <laughs> so that was going from one like really great experience to a slightly challenging experience. But um, uh, I lost my train of thought. What were you talking about? Uh, well, you know, I, I mean, we just the Michael Jackson thing. I mean, what do you make of the fact that, I mean, I guess any any pedophile or any uh, cr criminal could choose their victims and, and eliminate some people, but the Macaulay Culkins of the world and the Corey, uh, I can't remember which Corey it was, but Corey no, Hames? No, Corey the yes. They yeah. both come out and, and said repeatedly, no, nothing ever happened. And, and they were his buddies. I mean, inappropriately so at a certain point in time. Um, here's the, pr here was the case. Okay. First of all, I like to say if I'm ever in trouble, God forbid I won't be, but if I ever am I'm calling Tom Mesereau, because <laughs> they, I mean, they, in a lot of ways, this was a flawed case from the get go. Yeah. Uh, remember it started with the uh, documentary that Martin Bashir put out uh, where uh, M M Martin Bashir was doing a documentary and then Michael Jackson was talking to him and this young boy came in and was leading his head on his shoulder and they reveal that they slept in the same bed or, you know, they yeah, had right. and everybody was like, what? And so uh, there's a long backstory. I mean, we could talk about this for 10 years and it's a little fuzzy because it's quite a while ago, but the point is that 
that sparked the criminal case. Um, this trial, the trial that I ended up covering, uh, where it ended in acquittal on all counts, um, Tom Snedden, the DA, uh, ended up jumping on that case. What I don't believe he realized at the time when he grabbed that particular victim, uh, that young boy, was that the entire family, because Michael Jackson was a very smart guy. Remember, he bought the Beatles catalog. Right. So on well, the advice I, of Paul McCartney, though, right? <laughs> that, 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 on the advice of Paul McCartney, I think Paul, Paul, I think when they did the, um, what was the, it wasn't, it was Ebony and Ivory when they did that song together. Oh. I think that's when Paul McCartney, the story goes, sort of said, hey, man, if you really want to get rich, what you do is you buy the cat, the back catalogs of different artists. And he outbid, or he had, he outbid, I think, Paul McCartney. And I don't, don't think they ever spoke again. I oh. mean, Wow. Brutal. wow. Brutal. Amazing. Yeah. But I guess uh, what happened, not to get too far into the, the trial, but one thing that uh, that occurred, I believe the timeline is that after they raided Neverland, then they they discovered that while Martin Bashir was filming um, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson was also filming uh, Martin Bashir and would mm. keep the camera rolling. And after, because remember, Fox did that. Uh, other documentary, the footage you were never meant to see. That right. was Michael Jackson footage. But anyway, as a part, this wasn't in the documentary that aired, but as a part of that, Michael Jackson's photographer interviewed that entire family, the accuser, his mother, his siblings. And they sat there in this little area, the set, and spoke for a long time about how anybody who thinks that Michael Jackson was a molester, has a dirty mind, he's like a father to me, um, over and over and over and compassionate. So they had it on tape. Yeah. The accuser. And so they had to then rejigger the timeline and say that the abuse happened after that tape was recorded, which didn't, it, it, a lot of people found that very hard to believe because of the timeline. It was just, remember they flew to Florida and they made this claim that they kept the family from seeing the Bashir documentary. And then on the way back, I mean, it was so convoluted. Yeah. And, uh, so it was a very flawed case. And the, the other part was that the DA was very overconfident. I mean, he literally held a news conference saying, you know, reporter, spend some money while you're in town. And he seemed very overconfident. And Tom Mesero came in with his head down, very quiet and, uh, you know, just destroyed the case. So, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is that doesn't mean that the those two young men who spoke are lying because they weren't the 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 victims, even though one of them did testify. But there seems to be a pattern with uh, people who, at some point, say X Y Z happened, at another point, say nothing happened, and that is part of the very difficult and agonizing dynamic that happens in a lot of sexual abuse cases, not yeah. just. Yeah, you know, well, have people who've been molested by clergy and by other people who defend them, defend them, defend them, because it's they get in their head groomed. Yeah, groomed. So yeah. it's a very tough case. It's a very tough situation, and it's a tragedy. Um, it's just one of the most surreal cases that I've that I've ever covered. Just wow. Yeah, I know. Well, and the other one that you're sort of known for covering, and well, you wrote a book about it, Jody Arias. What fascinated you the most about her? I mean, obviously, a female killer like that is is kind of rare because it didn't even necessarily seem like a crime of passion. It seemed like she was. I don't know. I I, I, I just had this a couple of hours before, so there was that. Was they did have sex a couple of hours before the murder, before she well, murdered. Well, right, but I'm saying that it it wasn't like, it didn't seem like it was something out of anger. She seemed, you know, I don't know if the word is conniving or and manipulative as many people can be. Like, not that she planned it, but- I think she did plan it. There's a lot of evidence that she planned. Well, right, but that's what I'm saying. Like, that, that, that this sort of evil was in her that I don't think is in her, in well, somebody that might just say about cases in general. I personally am actually not interested in true crime. 
that's kind of like an odd fact because I've been in it. I was right. in it for a long time and I just sort of fell into that genre. And um, when I left local news and I started working celebrity justice and I started covering the Jackson trial, then I filled it at Core TV, then I had a crime show on HLN and that was what we talked about. But I do think that the interesting aspect of all these criminal cases is that they are extreme examples of personality dysfunction, mental illness, um, and character defects that exist in milder form in a lot of people. Yeah. So I think that the prosecution in Jody Arias case said that she suffered from borderline personality disorder. And I would agree, not that I'm a psychiatrist, but I do think that that's a really strong case. Like she's an extreme borderline. After that case or during that case, when I had to really study that, I started realizing, wow, there are borderlines out there and I've run into them and I've experienced them on a milder level, you know? Uh, sure. So somebody who doesn't know where they end and you begin, somebody who has no understanding of boundaries, somebody who sort of co-ops your life and suddenly your friends are their friends, your hobbies are their hobbies. Yeah, you know, they're always there bearing gifts, just like Jody was always there to do whatever yeah. Travis wanted. And uh, so, yeah. There are good case studies so that you can be hyper aware of when these kinds of things are happening. And I would say in general, when somebody just saunters into your life offering to do anything for you, be Wrong. careful. Yeah. <laughs> That's good advice. That's a lesson yeah. I don't have to learn, I hope, personally. <laughs> but with with there's, I mean, they're just, you know, I was just thinking about it today. I'm like, what a really crazy time to be alive. I mean, with social media and everybody's an expert, we're living through a pandemic and just, you know, an election is coming and it is really, really nuts. What do you think? I mean, I have a, a few in mind. What do you think is the crime right now that is going to sort of uncover and, and blow the lid off of something even bigger? Um, well, you know, crime that's happening right now. And, uh, you know, I've done a documentary on this called Countdown to Year Zero, which is streaming now on Amazon Prime, and I urge everybody to watch it. Mm -hmm. um, basically, Countdown to Year Zero, Year Zero is 2026. If we don't transition away as a society from meat and dairy, uh, by 2026, we're going to have an ecological collapse that is going to make uh, the hottest day that you've ever experienced seem like a tea party because um, we're going to really be in a, an environmental crisis. As Greta Thunberg says, our house is on fire. And people, just like people, don't want to acknowledge there's a pandemic and they're going to parties and they're socializing and they're singing and they're going to Mount Rushmore and having and eschewing social distancing and they're they're just you know, kumbaya, and then they're getting sick and dying. And you saw the the story about the, the guy who said, I was an idiot. I couldn't stay home yeah. anymore. I went to a party and I'm dying. Yeah. And then he died. Mm -hmm. And so the, the crime, I know it'd be much more interested to talk about a juicy crime that involves a lot of sex and cheating yeah. and everything else. Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> right. Exactly. The real crime that's happening now is that animal agriculture is the leading destructive force on our planet, it caught processed meat is cancer causing. Red meat is likely a, a lot. This is ruled by the World Health Organization, a likely carcinogen. The American Cancer Society just came out and issued a warning about eating animals. Um, it's the leading cause of habitat destruction, wildlife extinction, uh, water pollution, drought, and yeah. human world hunger because we're only 7.8 billion humans and we raise and kill, depending on how you calculate it. 56 to 70 billion animals who, I say who, eat a lot more than they produce as food. So we could eliminate world hunger. So people right. who say to me condescendingly, you know, oh, I love your passion, but, you know, I care about people. Well, I care about people too. I'd like to see them not die of starvation because you like to eat a chicken wing. And now 
slaughterhouse workers are dying. And so we, the Trump administration declared slaughter. Are you talking about through the pandemic? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Slaughterhouses are a, um, they're slaughterhouses for people too now. Um, they're a hotbed of the COVID-19. It's slaughterhouses, prisons, and nursing homes are the, where the clusters, because they work side by side, killing, killing, killing. Okay. And so Americans who pat themselves on the back, a him side, do yoga. I'm so loving, but they're hiring somebody else who has on the lowest leg, leg of the economic ladder to go in there. And now those people are dying. As of June 24th, a hundred slaughterhouse workers have died. Yeah. Well, well, what do you make of, I mean, wrong. everything, everything from uh, just veganism to the pandemic to, um, I mean, everything in between, everything's become political though. And that's, that's part of the problem We're we're, you know, I don't know, sort of the, I'm a registered independent. Some of us are feel stuck in the middle, like a, a little child and mommy and daddy are fighting. I mean, I don't know how we make progress on a lot of these things because wearing a mask is a political statement now, you know? Yes, I just, I was just driving. Uh -huh. I had to go one place and I was very careful. Um, and I wear a mask. Oh my God, my mask is like it's N95 squared. And um, I drove by this one place that's a sports bar and they had all these American flags out and the cars were packed. The whole parking lot was packed. There's no outdoor seating. So they're all in there, which is exactly the place which we've been told not to do indoor dining. Right. Finish. So then the other restaurants that don't have the American flags out there are closed. So who's the smarter? The one who's getting all this business, but those people might walk out and die of COVID-19 or the ones who are saying we're going to remain closed. I mean, I, I mean, I, and that's the thing too. I, I get it. People are losing their livelihoods. They can't work. And, you know, I mean, a bunch of bar owners in Florida, uh, in, for instance, are furious that they can't open, whereas restaurants and everybody else can. That's because they're drunk. I know. I speak it with, from expertise as a recovering alcoholic. Yeah. Um, they get drunk and they start making out. They don't. Uh, they don't listen to social distancing when you've got a few to keep no, you. No, no, so I know that. It, it makes sense. I mean, look, I, I've been watching this Netflix. I think it's Netflix. No, maybe it's Amazon Prime. Anyway, it's a great courses, and it's the Black Death, the plague in the Middle Ages. So I thought I'll watch this. This is interesting since right. we're going through. It killed half of Europe. Half of Europe. These plagues are nothing to sneeze at literally oh, right and, um you know of course they do stem from our abusive animals these are zoonotic diseases right, right? It, zoonotic it, yes my i i you know in january something popped up on that netflix called pandemic and i guess yeah. i i don't know if bill gates had some hand in it and that's again like conspiracy theories have twisted around but he made this documentary probably in 2015 and then it yeah. came out in 2016 uh-huh and I learned a lot, uh, you know, and it was very interesting. I didn't know that all these uh, viruses and, and pandemics and, and uh, epidemics, they come from what, livestock? No, it comes well, from- Some of them- it, Doesn't it come from the wild and then to livestock and then it jumps to humans? I yeah, mean, that's but right now that the swine flu in China that, yeah. is, that has the basis of another pandemic. They all stem from animals. They were zoonotic diseases. And so, um, if we stopped abusing animals, we wouldn't have another pandemic and we wouldn't have had this pandemic, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it, it first came to, to notice at a wet market in China. Now right. after, well, the Trump administration uh, promoted a conspiracy theory saying it was a lab in Wuhan, China, which everybody pretty much discredited scientifically. Right. The Chinese government Oh, issued something that was very suspicious just uh, about a month ago. Said, no, you know, it wasn't the Chinese, uh, the, the market. They were victims too, because we tested some of the animals and they don't, they didn't have it. Although the people did who were there. Well, guess what? The animals who had it were, were sold, consumed and are long gone. So it started from our abuse of animals. Either it's a bat, a pangolin, it doesn't matter. The, the swine flu is the abuse of pigs. The avian flu is the abuse of birds. Uh, the mad cow disease is the abuse of cows. So 
How stupid are we as a species? Now we're torturing a whole bunch of monkeys to come up with a vaccine or whatever we're trying to do when the answer is let's transition to a plant-based society where we can have a Beyond Meat burger, an Impossible burger. There's pork now that Impossible Foods has put out that they can't distinguish it from the actual pig. They really? Think this, yes, they did a thing on one of the channels. I think it was... I don't know if it was CNBC or Bloomberg or one of them, but they were um, testing this woman who was not a vegan. She was just testing it. She said, I can't tell the difference. If you can't tell the difference, if the pandemics stem from this, if your carbon footprint is so much worse eating animals, which is contributing to climate change uh, and all the other things I mentioned, habitat destruction, wildlife extinction, the destruction of the Amazon, human world hunger, and it creates diseases in humans like heart disease, cancer, erectile dysfunction, and there's a connection now to dementia that's coming up is again, the clogging is systemic. How stupid as a species do we have to do to say, well, it's a personal choice. So is driving the wrong way down a freeway. You know, so is killing a human being. Or it wearing a mask. A personal <laughs> choice. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, but you know, we're stubborn as humans. I used to work with a raging diabetic and he didn't want to eat that crap, you know, food, a food that might be better for him. He's just, yeah. you know, he didn't want to do it. I mean, I don't know how you change um, the, the history of, of mankind. I mean, we've been eating animals for a long time. You know what well, I mean? Let me, like, let, I don't me say know. This. let me say this, okay? There was yeah. a time when people smoked and doctors were paid to, you know, smoke. And we all saw those old commercials with Dr. Smoke. Right. <laughs> Then people started, you know, people were dying. There was the woman smoking. Remember that, that shot where she was yes, smoking yes. esophagus and yeah. they did a whole campaign smoking is very glamorous. Yeah, people still smoke, but they don't smoke as much as they did because they realize it's stupid. And it took them a long time to realize, you know, the big problem is that, and this is the problem with the libertarians. I was a libertarian when I was like 13, you know? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very simple concept. It's like, let people act in their self-interest. The only problem is that humans don't act in our self-interest, okay? If we acted in our self-interest, we wouldn't be drug addicts, alcoholics, obese, um, doing all sorts of things, eating animals. We wouldn't do all that because it's not in our self-interest. We are emotional beings and we are very easily manipulated. And now you have advertising that's very powerful, and they know how to trigger all the points that people want upward mobility, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, family values. They, they, they can, they can pull those strings like nobody's business. And so people are not acting in their self-interest yeah. at all. If they were, if people acted in their self-interest, they wouldn't be going around without masks. I'm looking out the window right now and there's people without masks. I mean, Tons. they said if everybody wore a mask, we could, we could put this down. Right, but right. I know, but that's what I mean. Like I said, it's become political. I mean, and people are are digging in, you know. I don't I don't I don't get it. I mean, it's a simple thing to do. Yeah, I hate it. It sucks, but guess what? <laughs> it's going to suck a lot worse to be on a ventilator or get sick at all with anything that we don't even know it could stay in your body forever like, you know, anyone that oh, has yeah. the chicken pox. Yeah. I don't know. I, everyone's so sure of themselves. I know because it's invisible, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's also invisible until you die of a heart attack. It's also invisible until you get cancer. Um, you know, it's just, it's well, so, frustrating. So clearly, I mean, we know clearly we this talk is- about my, uh, my nonprofit? Uh, yes, well, network? yeah. Not only, not only that, but I wanna talk about the, the new project with Amazon. I mean, this is all kind of yeah. tying it together, you know? So oh, tell yeah. me about everything that's going on with janeunchained.com. Thank you. Check out janeunchained.com and sign up. We only send two newsletters a week out, two emails, and uh, we bring you the very latest and on our whole movement, which is a global movement. It's growing rapidly. And so um, we had the documentary. Uh, we do have it still streaming, Countdown to Year Zero. If, if you want to live past year zero, I would suggest you watch it. It makes a very compelling argument for why we all need to go plant-based. And we profile the work of Dr. Silas Rao, who is a PhD from Stanford, a systems analyst who was instrumental in the acceleration of the internet speeds. He then went to work with Al Gore. He left Al Gore because Al Gore doesn't want to talk about animal agriculture. 
he just wants to talk about fossil fuels. And he um, started a campaign to wake the world up to the, the need to, to go plant-based. And uh, he personally believes that this, uh, and I think that there's a, a big argument to be made that this pandemic is sort of an intervention from mother nature, you know, wake up call and say, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's, uh, you know, oh, mother nature's writing something out, but it's like nature reacting to humans abuse of the planet and the animals on it. And it's gonna accelerate the transition of the plant-based diet because a lot of people are already looking at animal products and thinking, mm, you know, this started with a, an abuse of animals. It started in a slaughterhouse. Um, and also now that all the slaughterhouse workers are getting affected or a lot of them are with COVID-19 and they're sweating, they're yeah. sweating out of the food, right? Yeah. I mean, think about it. Think about people, it. People like to just think that their food comes from the grocery store. I mean, you know, we just yeah. do, you know, <laughs> there's not, there's no history there. Yeah. They just don't want to face the reality. They have, they're, they're in denial. I mean, there's this woman who has a sign down the block, do everything with love. And I want to knock on her door and say, so you don't eat animals then, right? Because that involves horrible violence and institu institutionalized torture. I don't do that, but people love to tell themselves, you know, hips, yeah. love, peace. And then they're engaging in incredibly violent behavior by extension. The one thing I know about covering trials is you don't have to pull the trigger yourself to be convicted of murder. If you're yeah. involved in the planning and the execution of a crime, you're just as guilty as the person who pulled the trigger or slit the victim's throat. So um, there's, there's a price to be paid. Look, there's a lot of depression. And I'll just say one more thing about it. Um, people are depressed, you know, I'm not. I am, I'm, well, not, I'm I'm actually doing pretty great. Up. I'm happy. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's times where I'm sad, but I, I'm not depressed person. And right. uh, they found now that really uh, the gut biome it produces the serotonin levels. And mm. so if you're eating really crappy food, yeah. your gut biome is not going to produce the kind of serotonin that you need for optimal happiness. So there's a very big connection between what you eat and how you feel emotionally, psychologically, your serotonin levels. So if you're depressed, some, a woman called me once and she said she, she was depressed and she didn't know what to do. I said, well, why don't you change your diet? Stop eating animals for a while, see what happened. And she doesn't, she didn't, she didn't like that answer. And I've run into her recently and she's still very depressed. So, yeah. what, you know, you can't help people. If, if you wanna walk around being a victim and being very depressed, I'm really sorry, it makes me sad, but I offered you a solution that you rejected out of hand. You yeah. know, there's something that will keep us in everlasting ignorance, and that is contempt prior to investigation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've, yeah, I've had friends that were smokers, and we know smoking is linked to depression. And yeah, of course, if you're abusing anything, alcohol or or whatever, yeah, yeah, it's not great for your spirit. And especially, I mean, just right now, you know, I don't know why I'm doing so well with this, but this quarantine, you know, we're living alone and I don't have any company. I mean, this, this is, this is my excitement every week <laughs> talking, talking to friends and, and new faces and some faces that we know and all that and other we stuff. On LinkedIn, I think, right. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah, where we were connected on LinkedIn. And I saw I, you post something and I was like, Hey, I'm going to ask Jane if she wants to yeah. hang out on Friday night. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, um, I don't want to talk in an echo chamber. I want to talk to people who might hear this and, you know, even if one person, if we have an hour conversation and one person goes, you know, maybe there's something there, maybe I should consider it, then it's worth my time because that one person then will influence others. And um, that's how we change the world. We are transitioning to a plant-based diet. And, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talked about the tipping point and talked about there's, you know, a certain percentage when, when a certain percentage changes, then the society flips and the rest go along. And that's, we're in the process of that happening. And so I, I feel very, um, you know, I'm very sad for the animals who are killed. And I do go, uh, well, not in the pandemic, but before that I've gone and I bear witness with the safe. Right. We go to, we go to slaughterhouses, we stand outside and we wait for the pigs to come and in the trucks and their babies, you know, they have the emotional and intellectual development of toddler humans and they look and they're thirsty and they're scared and they're babies they are six months old when they're killed. And we give them water and we comfort them. We touch them. We say, we're really sorry. We're so sorry. We love you. We love you. And then they, when you're looking at them with eye contact, it is 
harrowing. They are looking at you saying, where am I? Why am I here? Where's my mother? What happened? And uh, then they go in there and they're just violently killed. And then they become, you know, hot dogs and uh, bacon and uh, deli slices. So um, uh, I had a couple that they were going to go and the woman wanted to go. And then she called me up and she said, my husband can't go. He thinks he'll get sick. I said, well, then I hope he, if he can't even, if he can't be man enough to go and watch the pigs going into the slaughterhouse, I really hope he stops eating them. And I don't know what happened, but that's, yeah. see, there's a price to be paid. There is a price to be paid. You know, yes. one yeah. of the things that I learned about crime is that when somebody commits a crime, unless they're a sociopath or psychotic, they experience remorse, guilt. They want to revisit the scene of the crime. Jody Arias revisited the scene of the crime, went back to, uh, she had, you know, the, after the killer road trip and she killed him and then she went to Salt Lake City and then she right. came back to California. But when the memorial service was happening, she flew back to Phoenix and she went to Mesa and she, on the way to the memorial service, she asked the person driving, can you take me back to Travis's house? So she, criminals revisit the scene of the crime. Just because you get away with it, just because society says it's okay, don't you don't have to worry about that violence. There's nothing wrong with that violence because those individuals don't count. Sound like anything familiar? It still has a psychic toll on you. Your brain, your reptilian brain knows that you are killing, that you are a killer, and it has a psychic toll. It takes a toll. You just want people to do a little research. And I know that they can do that on your website, right? I mean, you have lots of resources. You have a good segue. That was recipes. a good segue. I mean, you know, I try to learn from the best, oh, Jane. Truth bomb. Truth bomb. That's what I do. I drop truth bombs. Because yeah. if you just, you know, chatter and chit-chat about it and don't, don't really give people a chance to confront the truth, then it's a waste of time. It's just like Greta Thunberg says, you know, your house is on fire. Wake up, wake up. Um, but yeah, so janeunchained.com. I had a show on CNN Headline News and I sometimes would go to Atlanta. I'd go to Vegan Soul in uh, the Highlands. It's a okay. restaurant. And uh, Slutty Vegan is also, I believe, in Atlanta. I haven't been there yet, but yes, it is. It's it's yeah. well known and highly regarded as great yeah. food. And uh, so after my show wrapped, and I had a nice run, six years, I left yeah. out great firms. They gave me my social media and I started going to protest because you can't go to protest when you're a reporter, but I was, I was unchained. Not both like kind, that. but yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you can't go as an individual. You can go to cover it. So right. after my girlfriend at the time said, well, you can go to a protest. We were talking about going to a protest. She goes, you're unchained. I said, oh yeah, Jane unchained. And so oh, I only came up with it. And, uh, so I, I started shooting on my GoPro because this was back in 2015 and I started shooting protests. I remember that one of the first protests I videotaped because what I noticed was there was a gap. The news media was completely ignoring the subject uh, of animal rights. Um, they will studiously do not cover it because look at the advertisers, meat, dairy, pharmaceuticals, the three industry, the industries that would collapse yeah. if people woke up. And so uh, it was cold in New York. Uh, the protesters weren't documenting what they were doing and everybody was running to get out of the cold. So I said, wow, there's, there's something I can do here. So I started recording on GoPro. I remember one of the first protests I covered was outside the Staples Center in Brooklyn. It was nine degrees and it was cold. We were all shivering and there were like 150 protesters there against Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus. And I remember thinking to myself, well, is this worth it? Is this you know, am I wasting my time? And I was like, no, something morally wrong is happening here. These people are here. It's my moral obligation to cover it, to, to give, to show it to other people. So not, not my, not my doing, it was the work of PETA and all sorts of other organizations. But now a few years later, Ringlings, hasta la vista, it's over. Yeah. And yeah. news and, you know, circuses that use animals are going to be over very, very soon. This is medieval. This is not 21st century. And zoos are not 21st century. They need to be transformed into sanctuaries or the animals need to be sent to sanctuary. So um, anyway, uh, when Facebook Live came along, I realized, oh, great. I don't have to stay up till four in the morning editing. I'll just go live. 
And then I realized, wait a second, this is a global movement. We have people all over the world having cubes of truth where they stand and they hold uh, they hold uh, laptops to show people what really happens in factory farms. And they just stand there motionless wearing a mask. And those are called cubes of truth. They're all over the world. And um, so I said, I need other people. I can't do this myself. So now we have 70 volunteer citizen journalists who go live all over the world at under normal circumstances before the pandemic, veg fest, animal rights conferences, uh, protest marches, uh, speak outs, cubes of truth vigils, you know, the slaughterhouse vigils. There's 800 slaughterhouse vigils around the world now, and that's growing rapidly. And um, so uh, we, we've really become like a network. And um, what happened was after I did my documentary, I have a great producer that I work with, uh, Eamon McChrystal. He's an Emmy winning producer. And uh, he said, do you want to what, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I've always had a dream of having a cooking show. And I think I was, must've been 20 some years ago. I was thrown out of the food network's office, you know, like, Oh yeah, right. sure. <laughs> we cooking show? yeah, we'll be in touch. Yeah. And um, so we did it new day, new chef. And uh, so we've had eight episodes is very successful on Amazon prime. And we just launched a new season called new day, new chef support and feed edition, which is, highlighting Maggie Baird's work to feed healthy vegan food to those who are most in need, like children's charities, homeless shelters, yeah. senior centers. And she's the mother of Billie Eilish and Fidel. Oh. Yeah. So Billie yes. Eilish makes a cameo appearance on our show. Oh, cool. So you've got Amazon Prime. Our, all of our shows are free. We, we do this educationally. We don't, I don't make a cent. It's a money pit for me, yeah. but that's okay. That's what, what money's for is to try to change the world to make it a better place. So you can go uh, watch Countdown to Zero on Amazon Prime, or you can watch New Day, New Chef. And then our latest is New Day, New Chef Support and Feed Edition. So okay. just put in support and feed because what, what Maggie Baird, who's a vegan, and so is Billie Eilish, and so is Phineas, um, uh, they came up with this great idea and they have Billy Eilish's shows. The catering is vegan, 100% vegan. Um, okay. um, they came up with this idea because all these restaurants are in trouble, including vegan restaurants. Let's get people to donate to support and feed. That money will go to the vegan restaurants. The vegan restaurants will make the food and then they'll feed nutritious food to those who need it. Because we know that those suffering from cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and other underlying health conditions are more likely to get very ill and die from COVID-19. So why should we feed them crap? We should right. feed them healthy food. So that's what we showcase on uh, New Day, New Chef, Support and Feed Edition. And all of this is on Amazon Prime. You can just go on Amazon Prime, put in Support and Feed, and it pops right up. And what, the documentary, you said Countdown Zero? Countdown Two Year Zero. Oh, Two Year, two year Zero. Okay. Yeah. And, and before I let you go, a lot of people have asked, like, what do you eat as a vegan? What's for dinner, Jane? Oh, my gosh. Well, OK, this. Well, here's an interesting thing. I'm not coming from up here because I, I'm not one of these people who is naturally healthy. I'm an addict by nature and I am attracted to all things bad. OK, <laughs> so uh, during this pandemic, I've really been able to start walking the walk as far as really healthy superfoods. So. Today I had oats with um, figs, mm -hmm. I and like figs and raisins and blueberries and strawberries and raspberries and um, flaxseed. Okay, and, yeah, that's and, you got all the you're hitting and all the parts. And okay. chia seeds, and then I put a little stevia, and I put some. Uh, cashew milk on there mm -hmm. and it was just the most energy do i seem like i'm lacking in energy no never never yeah never. so in fact people tell me chill out you're over <laughs> you're over just calm. Well, you are in california i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> you and could go that route yeah it's like it's super food you feel yeah. Great. And it's delicious. That that was delicious that I made this morning. Yeah. No, I mean, you. I mean, you know, the older we get, I've found that I have to eat sort of like that. Otherwise, 
bad things happen. I have ulcers or I get, you know, land in the hospital last fall. I mean, I just, I don't feel good if I eat, I don't eat a lot of junk food or fry food or any of that. I just don't, I can't, but what is for dinner? What are you having like this weekend? Are you going to a cookout or what, well, what does a vegan do? For as far as Jane and Shane, we do a daily vegan cooking show at 1230 Pacific, 330 Eastern called Lunch Break Live every day. Okay. This since we started it, with the second we found out Lunch Break Live existed, and we've never missed a day. We do Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's Eve, uh, Election Day. It doesn't matter. Wow. So tomorrow's 4th of July. I'm going to go out and make a um, Beyond Meat burger on the barbecue, which – Okay. Uh, I'm hoping I have enough propane, but I'm I'm work. I'll make it happen somehow. And then I'm going to be doing a remote interview on Streamyard, just like you are, with a vegan activist in Arizona who wrote a, a song called "I Don't Want to Go to Your Barbecue." <laughs> and okay. Uh, and so this is a thing with vegans. You know, uh, I also just started Plant Based Neighbor, which is going to be an app. It's now a website. You okay. can join it because we're, are you, would you consider yourself veg curious or on the journey? Um, I mean, I, I find that I'm eating less meat. I do love cheese, I have to say, but. <laughs> yeah, cheese is addictive. There's a more high quality in cheese. Yeah. That, um, nature put in there to get the baby calf to drink the breast milk of his or her mother. And so um, it takes probably 28 days to, uh, when I went vegan, I used to love cheese too. Uh, when yeah. it's liquid meat, and then about thirty days later, I was having lunch, and somebody put Parmesan cheese on my salad at a restaurant, and I tasted it. And I spat it out. I was like, "This is horrible." And I used to love Parmesan cheese because your taste buds revert. But the yeah. thing is that um, there are vegan cheeses that you can transition to. There's tons of them now, like Chow and Miyoko's and Tree Line and Follow Your Heart, so you can get those alternatives. But if you're veg curious and you're you're, you're, you know, that your transition, it's not about a word. We don't care if I, if that word disappeared tomorrow, vegan or plant-based, I could care less. Mm. It's, it's really about people getting on that journey. exactly what you just said. So I would consider you on the journey. So there's three categories. There's veg curious on the journey and vegan. So we're doing this so that we can encourage vegans to work together in their neighborhood, let's say on a normal 4th of July when people are grilling dead animals around me, which does happen and I have yeah. the smell of death and um, it's it's upsetting to me, honestly. And they're right out there and it has a really tough impact on me because I know those individuals, you know, I've, I've made eye contact with those animals as they go to their deaths. So it's really hard. So now with plant-based neighbor, I could contact a neighbor and say, yeah, how would you like to have a vegan cookout? We could also set up our, our grill and get neighbors and invite them and say, yeah. you know, why don't you try this? And why don't you try that? So it's a way to coordinate and also mentor and help those who are, who are curious. So join plantbasedneighbor.com. It's in beta testing right now. It's going to be a website soon. Okay. Okay. I mean, and, and an app soon. That's what I meant. Is that beyond? I mean, I've never tried any of the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Burger or whatever. Are they good? Have you had them? Do you like them? No, I like the Beyond Burger. The Impossible Burger is what the meat eaters like because it tastes so much like meat that I can't even. It's like so yeah. meaty. Um, right. You know what they realized? Just to explain for a second, is that it's just basic compounds. They don't even have to go through the animal. Like heme is what makes the animals meat meaty, but uh -huh. heme exists in nature. So you can put food together that mimics the water and the compounds and the heme. And so really that's 21st century thinking. You don't have to really sacrifice. You can have your burger. Nobody knows the difference. They've done these tests where, you know, oh. people go, Oh, this is real meat. I'd never eat a. I'd never eat a one of those damn ver veggie burgers. This is the meat, and they go, uh, "Hello, that's that's a veggie burger." Yeah. So if you can't tell the difference, or if it's just a slight, slight difference, uh, because look, we're all accustomed to like certain things. If you know, there's uh, different cultures like different things, right? So you go to a market that's an ethnic market. And there's a bunch of stuff you'd say, I, oh, I'd never eat that. Well, that's because you weren't raised eating that. So we're conditioned. We are conditioned to like certain things. So thinking for yourself is important, but it's also important for society. 
it's going to happen. It is going to happen because it has to happen. And the, 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 the smart people are really aware, even the own meat companies, JBS, which is a Brazilian owned company is among, if not the largest meat processor, they have an entire line of vegan products, which our vegan lawyer, Carissa Kranz, just certified with her B veg vegan certification company. And she said she couldn't eat it. It's just so much like me. Yeah. So, um, it's not designed for vegans. It's designed for meat eaters, you know? So uh, I would urge everybody this 4th of July, in fact, we're doing a campaign, boycott meat. Okay. Go declare your freedom from meat this 4th of July. Well, you know, I'm sure you spoke to some people and, and like you said, I'm, you know, a little curious as far as, you know, I have to sort of pull back on a lot of things. And by the way, it's very, very, very expensive. Uh, <laughs> I won't even tell you how much how much uh, like one steak is at the market right now, but it's it's prohibitively expensive, I would say. But I really appreciate your time, Jane. You're fascinating. You're so much fun. You are full of energy, and I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate everything. I hope you have a great Fourth of July weekend. I appreciate you being curious and being open to discuss. It takes a lot of courage for somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to listen to this and I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to absorb it. And I, I applaud you for that. That is well, thank big. you. Thank you. It's easy enough for me to do. So <laughs> you want, you have a wonderful weekend and thanks so much. And you know, if I can ever do anything for you, you which can. I already know, I know, I know what I can do for you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. You too. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.